Number 10, Driscoll Hotel, Austin. While there are many reportedly haunted hotels in Texas, this one seems to top many lists for the most ghostly activity. Most of this seems to stem from the very chilling stories of room 525. In the 1880s, there was a young couple that was having their wedding at the hotel, or at least that was the plan. The groom got cold feet and left the bride at the altar. Now heartbroken, she ran upstairs to their suite, room 525, and took her own life. And it said she still walks the halls in her long white gown. But that isn't the end of the story. Because in 1991, another bride was spurned at the altar, and after going on a shopping spree with the groom's stolen credit card, she too returned to room 525 and took her own life. Since then, guests have seen her carrying a pistol and walking into the room, all without ever opening the door. So don't stay in room 525 or you may never check out. There's also an eerie painting that's said to be inhabited by the spirit of a young girl, the daughter of a senator, whose expression seems to change on its own. People who view the painting have said that they feel like they were floating off of the ground, though they remained on the floor. They also say that their equilibrium and balance was off for a few hours after looking at her. Number 9, USS Lexington, Corpus Christi. Now before I tell you about this spooky ship, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you can catch all of our amazing videos. As a naval vessel that saw actual battle, there have been multiple lives that were lost on board, including that of an engine room operator who still roams the ship at night waiting for the battle to end. The crew of the ship have often reported flickering lights and doors slamming on their own, which given that this is a very well maintained historical site, you'd think that they would have found the cause by now. Maybe it's just the ghosts of sailors lost to time. Coming in at number 8, we have the Marfa Lights in, you guessed it, the town of Marfa. While there is so much beauty in the area and plenty of non-spooky reasons to visit, the main tourist attraction to this quaint little town are floating, sourceless lights that seem to change color and even move in the night sky. Many visitors make the journey at all times of year to see the lights, and there's even a yearly festival made in their honor. Reported since 1883 by people of all ages and professions, no one knows what these floating orbs are. They appear at random, but usually in the same area of the sky, and since there's so much open space and low light pollution, it's perfect for stargazing. Or seeing spooky orbs, I guess. <laughs> some say that these lights are UFOs, some say spirits, and others think that they're just headlights. All that I know is that if I see a mysterious floating orb, I'm going the other way. Number 7. Woman Hollering Creek, San Antonio. Said to be the home of La Llorona, or the Weeping Woman, this creepy creek leaves anyone who visits with a sense of dread. As the story goes, La Llorona was a woman who was distraught that her once doting, affectionate husband left her for another woman. And after confronting him and leaving the confrontation with cuts and bruises, she waded into the water, dressed in her best clothes, and drowned herself in the creek right after doing the same to the rest of her family. Her chilling screams for her children can be heard all the way from the highway, giving her and the creek its very apt name. Many people have felt themselves being drawn towards the water by ghostly voices, and some have even been tugged towards the bank of the creek. Perhaps it's La Llorona looking for her next victim. The screams heard and feelings of being pulled into the water have mostly been reported by younger people, making this all the more terrifying given what La Llorona did. Number 6, El Paso High School. Now, when you're thinking of haunted places, a school isn't exactly the first place that comes to mind, but this one has quite a story. In 1985, the graduating class received their yearbooks, and when basking in the nostalgia of their group photo, they noticed something odd. A woman who no one could identify was in the picture with them. Now, obviously, that would be quite concerning. <laughs> I know I'd be freaked out if there was someone I'd never seen before standing next to me in a picture. The blurry apparition still has not been identified to this day, but some think it's a student who fell from a window years before who never got to graduate. I say give her the diploma. She's already in the yearbook. Sticking in El Paso, in our number five spot is the Plaza Theater Performing Arts Center. As someone who loves the theater, I try to see as many shows as I can, but I think I'll skip visiting this theater, no matter how good the production is. Built in 1930 as a movie house, demolished for a parking lot in the late 80s, and rebuilt as a live theater space, this building has seen many, many changes, but some things have stayed constant throughout its history. Many workers of the building have reported seeing a man in one of the box seats, in a tuxedo, smoking a cigarette. 
One crew member recalls seeing him after turning on the stage lights, sitting alone in the box, as though he'd been there for hours already before the lights came on. And when she saw the smoking man, he turned to her and said, We all have our time to die and then threw himself headfirst over the balcony, vanishing before he could hit the ground. A former vice president of the theater also recalls seeing a ghostly girl bouncing a ball in the aisles of the theater and always staring. He also noticed that there was a rag doll that seemed to appear and disappear on its own, moving to locations that it couldn't have without someone's help. Even locked doors didn't seem to stop it from appearing in the projection booth. Number 4. Yorktown Memorial Hospital Established in 1951, this abandoned hospital has been named one of the most haunted places in America. And since over 2,000 patients are said to have died within its walls before it shuttered its doors in 1992, I can see why. Reports of apparitions of people in hospital gowns running through the corridors or hiding in rooms are numerous, along with moving wheelchairs, disembodied voices, and footsteps. But there are some who have even more chilling stories. While exploring the halls and rooms that have remained largely untouched since its closure, some ghost hunters have been touched, had their clothes tugged on, or even pushed to the ground while being given a ghostly warning. Some of the spirits are believed to be that of patients who had illegal medical experiments performed on them and lost their lives in the process, making for a very vengeful ghost. Number 3. The Screaming Bridge in Arlington On the night of February 4, 1961, six from the local high school were taking a drive after seeing a movie earlier in the evening. While driving down Bedford Road toward the rail crossing bridge, which had mysteriously been burned down a few years previous, only rebuilt earlier that year, they were startled by another car reversing and honking its horn wildly. This caused the driver to speed up out of fear and, not realizing that the bridge was out, the car careened over the edge and crashed into the other side of the ravine. Unfortunately, three of them lost their lives that night, and their screams of terror can still be heard by anyone traveling the renamed Greenbelt Road. The saddest part of this story is that the car that startled them was being driven by a man who had just barely avoided going over the edge of the broken bridge himself, and he was reversing and honking to warn them of the danger ahead. The entire area, now known as Death Crossing, is now blocked off and no traffic travels through. At number 2 on our list, we have La Carafe in Houston. This historic bar, built originally as a bakery in 1860, has been serving patrons for decades. But many come not only for the drinks, but for a paranormal experience. Bartenders and visitors alike have seen apparitions of a hulking man walking upstairs and hearing his giant footsteps pacing the floor. No one knows who this may be, but some say he died there from some nefarious means. The former manager of the bar can also be seen staring out of the top floor window, looking over his patrons and ensuring they're having a good time. And he seems a bit more friendly. <laughs> However, there are some that report the sounds of a body being dragged across the floor above, but when the sound is followed, nothing's there. Makes you wonder what happened upstairs. And since it's one of the oldest buildings in the city that's been in continuous use, it's become a tourist hotspot and a historical site. Personally, I won't be stopping in for a drink anytime soon, no matter how good the cocktails are. And finally, number one, the Alamo. While students are taught to remember the Alamo, they don't really teach about all of the spirits who can never forget. In the infamous battle, thousands of soldiers lost their lives, and many were dumped into mass graves and others left to rot out in the sun, so it makes sense that you'd have some pissed off ghosts wandering the ground. There have been countless reports of soldier apparitions walking with weapons in hand, taking their usual patrol, and even full platoons screaming and charging into battle. Even in the afterlife they couldn't get away from war, and so they continue to fight their invisible enemy. There are also accounts of a small blonde haired boy hiding in multiple places where the gift shop now stands, so make sure to pick up your haunted keychains. While the buildings are beautiful to look at and the area is interesting to explore, the history can leave one with a haunting feeling. And with all those spirits around, I'd be careful touring here, especially at night. This American serial killer is sometimes known as the Alligator Man, and it's going to become obvious why very soon. After fighting in Europe during World War I, he opened a saloon called the Sociable Inn in Elmendorf, Texas. At first, everything seemed normal people were coming in for some bevies and some banter, and it was all a great time. However, it can't always be just bevies and banter. Local heads turned when he built a pond and bought five alligators to live in it. He would charge visitors if they wanted to see them, especially during feeding time. The meals were mostly live cats and dogs, so 
poor puppies. <laughs> then women in the area reported missing. Some of them were barmaids at the inn, then former girlfriends of Joe Ball, and then finally his wife. Joe Ball had been killing them, butchering their remains, and then feeding them to his alligators. Now, I'm not sure how people settled a relationship quarrels back then, but I feel like there are a lot better ways than just feeding the missus to the pet alligators. But that's just me though. Starting in 1936, he did this for two years. He was taken in for police questioning but didn't crack. He believed he was safe because there was no way for police to even find the bodies. However, he did have an accomplice who did talk. The man told the police how Bo had forced him to move female body parts at gunpoint. The police showed up at the inn and then asked to inspect the meat barrel. Joe Bo hit the no sale button on the cash register. He then reached inside and grabbed his pistols from the drawer and shot himself in the heart and thus ends the story of the alligator man. Next up on number 9 now we have Andrea Yates. In 2001 she confessed to drowning her own 5 children in their bathtub. She had been suffering with postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis. She was in and out of psychiatric clinics to help treat her and was given cocktails of medications to help curb her suicidal tendencies. A psychiatrist warned Andrea and her husband Rusty not to have any more children as it would only worsen her condition. Soon after her release though she conceived their 5th child. By the following year she had degenerated into a near catatonic state. She began mutilating herself and reading bible verses feverishly. On June 20th 2001 her husband left for work against their doctors instructions to supervise Andrea around the clock. She then filled the bathtub with water and one by one she began to drown her young children. The final child tried to run when he saw his sister floating in the bathtub but he too was caught and killed. Next up at number 8 we have the candy man. No it's not as sweet as it sounds. That's the gruesome nickname name given to Dean Kaur, a pedophile killer responsible for the murder of at least 28 people in Texas. Some even believe that number could be as high as 47. 28, 47, I mean that's a bloody big range. He would often take his victim's car and house keys as a trophy. His sole targets were males between the ages of 13 and 20 and he would lure them in with the help of two teenage accomplices. Victims would then be tortured, beaten and raped, sometimes for days before Kaur eventually strangled or shot them. Kaur got his nickname the Candyman due to his family owning a candy making business which he was fired from for making sexual advances on employees. Um, objection, why did his parents do nothing when they saw this go on the first time round? I mean they could have saved the world from a whole lot of grief. In a cruel twist to the murders, Cole would often make the teenagers write letters to their parents explaining their absence, leaving police to assume that they had just simply run away. Moving on to number 7 now, we have Carl Eugene Watts. When Watts was 12 years old, he began to fantasize about torturing and killing girls and young women. During adolescence he began to stalk girls and it's thought he killed his first victim before the age of 15. In 1969 he was arrested for sexually assaulting 26 year old Joan Gave. He was sentenced to a mental hospital in Detroit. In 1974 he killed his first official victim, torturing and brutally murdering 20 year old Gloria Steele. From there on he would go on to kill a further 22 confirmed people, mostly women, and would claim that he also killed up to 40 or perhaps even 80 people during this crazy killing spree. He was sentenced to life in prison where he died in 2007 at the age of 53. Next up on number 6 now we have George Hennard, also known as the Lubis Massacre. This mass shooting took place on October 16th 1991 in Lubis Cafeteria in Killeen, Texas. On that day Hennard drove a pickup truck through the front window of the cafe and he screamed about local women being vipers and said this is what they've done to him and his family and that this day was payback day. He then opened fire on everyone inside the building and continued continued to hunt people down as they fled. He killed 23 people. 10 of them with single shots to the head and wounded another 37. After a tense standoff with police, he committed suicide with a shot to the head. The event now stands as the fourth deadliest non school mass shooting in US history. Moving on to number 5 now, we have the Eyeball Killer. In the 1990s, Texas was terrorized by a serial killer with a grisly signature move, eye removal. Their first victim was Mary Pratt, killed on December 13th, 1990. When the body was autopsied, the coroner found that her eyes had been carefully removed from their sockets. This grisly detail was actually kept hidden from the media and the case soon went cold. On February 10th 1991, Susan Peterson was found dead. Her eyes had also been removed. Police increased patrols in the area of Dallas where the murders were taking place, but still the eyeball killer claimed another victim, Shirley Williams, found on March 18th. Her eyes were also missing, but she also had facial bruises and a broken nose, consistent with being punched in the face. A woman tipped off the police about a man called Charles Albright. She said he was known to have an obsession with knives 
and eyes. Strange combination. Police found that he had a history of assaulting prostitutes. They acquired a search warrant for his home and found a number of suspicious items that possibly linked him to the murders. He was charged with the eyeball killer murders and a further unresolved murder of Rhonda Bowie. The prosecution's case fell apart though and he was sentenced to life for only one of the murders. Although heavily suspected to be the actual eyeball killer, the murders remain officially unsolved. Next up at number 4 we have David Koresh. He was the leader of a Christian religious group in Elk, Texas called the Branch Davidians. The group had been known to officials for over a decade and they did have run ins with the law before, but everything came to a head in 1993. On February 28th, America's Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms attempted to execute a search warrant on the Branch Davidians compound. They were investigating sexual abuse charges and illegal weapons violations. Now, I'm no expert, but I'm 100% sure that neither of those fall under the category of divine. The group responded to this with guns. A fierce gun battle erupted, resulting in the deaths of four government agents and six Branch Davidians. The FBI then took over and seized the building for 51 days. During the final assault by the FBI, a fire broke out and spread quickly through the compound. Nine made it out alive, but a further 76 were killed, including their leader, David Koresh, and good riddance to him. All right, then, moving on to number three now. We have Devin Patrick Kelly. On November 5th, 2017, Kelly opened fire in a small church in the rural community of Sutherland Springs, Texas. 26 people were killed, including an unborn baby. It became the deadliest mass shooting in the history of Texas. 20 others were injured. Kelly was later found dead in his car from a self inflicted gunshot wound to the head after an intense police chase. Investigators determined that Kelly was in a domestic dispute with his mother in law and would often send her threatening texts. Now, she often attended that church, and it seems that Kelly went there to kill her. However, she was not there that day when he unloaded his weapons. One official said at the time, there are many ways that he could have taken care of the mother-in-law without coming with 15 loaded magazines and an assault rifle to a church. I think he came here with a purpose and a mission. At number 2 now we have the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. I'm including this in our video about Texas, but this story is famous across America. It even inspired two movies. In 1946, Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry were parked in their car in a secluded area of a park. They were attacked by a stranger wearing a white mask with holes cut out around the eyes and mouth. Hollis was beaten and Larry was molested. They survived but the next victims unfortunately did not. Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore parked their car in a similar spot and were brutally shot in the back of the head execution style. The same happened to another couple and then another. One of the final victims was Katie Sharks. She narrowly escaped but wasn't able to see the killer because of the blood pouring from her face into her eyes. I have no words. The killer never attacked again and their identity remains a mystery to this day. And finally number one now we have Sean Allen Berry, Lawrence Russell Brewer and John William King. These were the three men who committed one of the most horrific murders that I've ever heard of. On June 7th 1998 these three white supremacists kidnapped James Bird Jr in the town of Jasper, Texas. They dragged him out the back of a pickup truck along an asphalt road for three miles. James remained conscious throughout most of the ordeal and was killed halfway through the dragging when his right arm and head were severed from his torso. His body was dumped outside of a nearby church. The killers made little to no attempt to hide the killing and police quickly tracked them down and they were sentenced for the murders. The ringleader, Brewer, was sentenced to death and executed via lethal injection on September 21st, 2011. King remains on death row while appeals are pending. Berry was sentenced to life in prison. The killing actually led to a whole new law being passed by President Obama to protect individuals on the basis of race, sexual orientation and gender. Alright, coming in at number 10 we have Lechuza. Ooh, I love a good owl, but this one is not your average mouse catcher. Lechuza is a shape-shifting witch who flies through the night hunting for prey. While in flight, she may look like an owl, when a Lechuza is stopped they have bird bodies and human faces, so basically a lot like a harpy. The women seem to be hybrid monsters as in their human lives they were said to have sold their soul to the devil who gave them intense magic powers in exchange for their souls. How do you know you're in the presence of a Lechuza? Well, they'll let you know by a series of whistling and baby noises. Those who try and investigate what the noises are will likely become dinner for the owl. 
Holy she witches. Not great. Coming in at number nine, we have the Chubacabra. Ah, the legend of the Chubacabra. This one isn't constricted to Texas alone. The Chubacabra story first sprang up in Puerto Rico. It is said to be a blood sucking monster from the deep that attacks animals and drinks the blood of livestock, especially goats, which is why the creature's name translates to goat sucker in Spanish. Anyway, in Texas, reports of the Chubacabra were rife in the year 2007 when a woman named Phyllis Canyon reported seeing one of the blood sucking monsters at her ranch in South Texas. She also reportedly found a number of chickens with their throats torn open. This sparked a whole chubacabra panic, and the legend of the beast was firmly consolidated in the Lone Star State law. Coming into number eight, we have the Chinese Cemetery. There is a strange urban legend surrounding a seven foot tall ghost and her lover at the Lona China Cemetery in Texas. This isn't just your classic ghost haunting in a graveyard, except actually, I guess it is, only there's a freakish tall ghost. Mm. The story goes that a man wanted to run away with his lover of Chinese descent, but he was forbade by his great grandfather who owned the cemetery. The issue here was an issue of race. The man was Anglo Hispanic, but his grandy didn't want him mixing. I bet that old racist isn't pleased that the cemetery is now called the Chinese cemetery. Hey. Anyway, both the ghost of the tall woman and the man are said to roam the cemetery at night looking for one another, but sadly, they never quite meet, which is depressing. Apparently the female has been known to reach out and touch you, thinking that you might be the lost love. Since shivers up my spine. Ooh. Coming in at number 7, we have the legend of Midget Mansion. Not the most politically correct name, but it seems that Midget Mansion is the name this urban legend is best known by in San Antonio. It seems that the house in question is a mansion with low hanging fixtures and ceilings custom built for a family of small people. A husband and a wife and their normal sized children took up residence in this home. The father was said to be a respected businessman in the 1920s and was well liked in the community, who found him to be a novel addition. It seems sadly the man went mad one day and murdered his entire family. What well, with the murders and the odd size of the home, nobody really wanted to buy it, so it fell into disrepair. It seems that the ghostly sounds emanating from the building and strange shadows lurked for many, many years. A lot of people who went to the abandoned house felt a malicious presence. From my research, it seems that the old house has finally been pulled down in favour of condos. However, the ghostly presence, the trauma of the family left behind, is apparently still rife in folklore. Coming into number six, we have El Kukui. Am I saying this right, Texas? Let me know, because I'm just a humble British gal who has no idea really. So these urban legends come around so much, I honestly feel like in every country and within that, a lot of provinces and states have their own version. El Kukui is a Texan bogeyman, but worse. Apparently. Now, the legend describes the beast as male, small, humanoid with glowing red eyes. Al Kukui hides in closets and under beds and comes for naughty children in the night. While this does seem like your classic boogeyman stuff, it seems that there have been some reported sightings of El Kukui over the years. Now, this leads me to think that actually, maybe there is something more to this urban legend after all. Coming into number five, we have the hitchhiker of White Rock. This legend comes from White Rock Lake in northeast Dallas, where reported a 20 year old girl committed suicide in the lake in the 1930s. Nobody knows why she took her own life, although many suspect it was as a result of heartache. It's always heartache, isn't it? To this day, people report seeing a woman standing by the lake in a wet dress. She stops cars that drive by and ask for a ride. Now, if you refuse her, an accident will likely befall you, but if you say yes, she will vanish in the back of your car, leaving just a puddle. Coming into number four, we have this South Texas head. Headless Horseman. During Halloween in San Patricio, you could enjoy a haunted hayride as you hear the ghostly legends of the Headless Horseman. It seems that in the 1800s, a wealthy man from Kentucky came to Texas to make his fortune. He was buying up land, and his last stop was the town of San Patricio. Unfortunately for him, his wagon was looted and he lost both his gold and his head to thieves. To this day, his headless body is said to ride the stretch from Mathias to San Patricio. Coming into number Number three, we have Demon's Road. It just isn't an urban's legend video without a spooky haunted road, is it? No. 
It's not. In Huntsville, Texas, there is a stretch of road called Bowden Road, although locals will tell you that it's called Demon's Road. Why? More because of the demonic things that have reportedly happened along it. Oh, and there's a cemetery at the end of the road, which doesn't really help matters. A whole bunch of Huntsville residents have had weird experiences along the road or seen strange things, but this isn't just your average haunted road. It seems that oftentimes spectres will follow people home. One popular story associated associated with Demon's Road is that a woman was visiting the cemetery at the end of the road when she saw a man lurking. Now, the man was acting a bit weirdly, he was pacing up and down, but she didn't pay him much attention. After that, as she was journeying home, she thought she saw the same man walking on the road, but once again, she just ignored it. When she got home, however, she thought she saw the same man staring at her from her bathroom mirror while she was in the shower. She screamed, he disappeared, and she never saw him again. Creepy. Coming into number two, we have the killer nurse ghost. Deep within the halls of Bexar County Hospital, still a fully functioning hospital in San Antonio, Texas, there is said to be a malicious spirit who kills patients at night. I had no idea that ghosts could actually kill, and like, I'm not happy about this turn of events. The legend goes that the nurse wanders the halls at night and kills patients in their room in consecutive room number order. Patients who were seemingly getting better would simply drop down dead, but before before they died, they would report speaking to a particular nurse, although none of the ward staff knew who that was. When CCTV footage was checked, it seems that all the patients who died were seen to be talking to thin air. It is likely that this urban legend is inspired by the real life killer nurse, Janine Jones, a serial killer nurse at the Bexar County Hospital, who did actually use lethal drug cocktails to murder 60 children. Finally, coming into number one, we have La Lorna. Part banshee, part horse, La Lorna is a famous female spirit that haunts El Paso. She roams the banks of Rio Grande, causing havoc. It is said that she killed herself and her children down by the river because she was jilted by her ex lover, who didn't want to marry her because he simply couldn't accept her kids. What a nasty man. Heartbroken and crazed, obviously killing your kids and yourself would be an emotional ordeal, and it seems that that emotion has carried on through into the afterlife. She's now heard wailing by the river. When she has been spotted, she is seen with the head of a horse and the body of a human. What's going on there? Honestly? I don't know. In the area, people are warned from going down to the river late at night as La Lorna will force you to keep her company. Whatever that means. In 2019, New Line Cinema are set to release a Hollywood adaptation of this called The Curse of La Lorna. So that's pretty exciting. A Hollywood movie made out of Texas urban legends. Great. 